Hey everybody, I, I'm, I'm Lane. Thank you for the awesome introduction. Super excited to, to be back here um, at Wharton and attend uh, talking to you guys about blockchain, which I think is super important. I love that that last panel ended with a uh, touching upon governance because I'm here to talk about governance, uh, and I think it's sort of the most important topic in blockchain right now. Uh, hopefully, I can convey that to you. Governance is enormously broad and enormously deep and vastly complex. So, like realistically, we can only scratch the surface in 20 minutes. But I, I, if I could just leave you guys uh, kind of curious and like wanting to learn more, I, I think we will have succeeded. Um, yeah, I, I remember studying like corporate governance here at Wharton, and all due respect to like people who specialize in that field, I thought it was one of the most boring topics in um, in business school at the time. You know, talking about structures of boards and incentives and things like that, and I, it just didn't kind of click for me. And I think one of the fascinating things about my journey down the uh, blockchain rabbit hole, I like to use rabbit slides uh, for these talks, um, has been like arriving at a lot of these things from first principles. Uh, and as we try to spin up these economies and these little micro, I call them like microcosms or microcosmos like Ethereum and other blockchains, um, just realizing like, oh my goodness, you know, like, governance is important. It, it exists for a reason and it solves real problems. So let's dive in. Um, Cool, you've heard about me, I'm Lane, I'm an Ethereum core developer, uh, but I also sort of focus a lot on the kind of human and social side of blockchain. And I personally feel quite strongly that if we don't have conversations about and address some of these kind of social questions, um, that uh, you know, blockchain will, will struggle to scale. So Ethereum is this weird, nebulous, kind of multifaceted uh, project which means different things to different people, right? Some people kind of focus on like the financial or economic aspect, the technology is very exciting. Uh, for me personally, the reason I find Ethereum so exciting is uh, because it allows us to, and this was touched upon in the last panel as well, it allows us to build better institutions for people. So in a nutshell, I like to describe Ethereum as um, yeah, it's an operating system for building better human institutions. Uh, and so, you know, we live in this world where we have all these institutions around us. We have governments, and we have companies, and we have banks. Um, we have identity systems. I mean, it's an endless list of things, very concrete things, very abstract things, like the Institute of Marriage. And I like to describe institutions as sort of like the furniture in the room. Um, and we don't often, like, in our daily lives, stop and think, like, why is the furniture configured in a certain way? And, like, could we move things around or configure things differently or better? Um, and Ethereum, as we'll talk about, is, and I should, when I say Ethereum, I mean, of course, I mean sort of blockchain in general and any platform that has uh, ability to do things like smart contracts, right? It really gives us a powerful tool to build better institutions. Um, in order to build these institutions, right, new identity systems, new money systems, new voting, and democracy, and all these things, uh, we, we want to we use tools like, like blockchain and like Ethereum to govern those systems, but the reality of where we're at right now actually is that if we don't figure out how to govern our blockchain systems first, um, if we don't figure out governance of blockchain, then our hands are tied and we can't build things on it because those things, those institutions of the future, really require a very stable um, base platform. So the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is uh, why governance is hard and kind of how it can go wrong. Uh, I'm sure many of you know who Vitalik Buterin is, um, brilliant thinker, he's the uh, creator of Ethereum. He has a lot of really um, powerful things to say on the topic of things like game theory and governance, incentive mechanism design. Um, this is an article that he published three, four days ago on a topic like collusion. This is on his Vitalik.ca website. Um, so I urge you to read this and read a lot of um, the other posts that, that, that he's put up there. Um, again, we don't have time to dig too deep into it, but uh, the point I want to make is that like, the, the thing that we're struggling with in Ethereum today is to design governance systems that are resistant to things like corruption and collusion and capture. Right? And, and these are sort of generic terms that, like I said a moment ago, like didn't really resonate with me until getting into blockchain and getting into Ethereum and kind of <laughs> trying to design better systems and arriving at this stuff at first principles. Um, when we talk about Ethereum governance, we get a lot of very naive proposals. People say, oh, like, what's the big deal? Let's just you know, have each Ethereum account, each Ethereum address like vote. Right? We give people tokens. Well, guess what? Right? You can permissionlessly create new accounts in Ethereum. Right, so people who have resources, who have you know, a decent amount of ether, can use some computing power and split that ether up into a million or a billion accounts and capture the network right? with, with, with more votes. And then so people will respond and say, okay, well, um, instead of doing one person, one, one, one account, one vote, like, let's make, make people do proof of work right, to generate a new account. Right? That sounds like that might work. 
And then the response is like, well, actually, that just collapses to plutocracy because proof of work means that if I have access to computing power to things like GPUs, then I can create a million accounts and capture the network, right? And then the next step would be like, okay, all right, like this isn't that hard. Maybe we can come up with some sort of like subjective measure of like contribution of value or like proof of human work, right? And then the response to that is like, okay, so what is that proof of human work, right? You're going to count lines of code or something? Well, then, you know, developers can take their source code files and split them up and put one word on each line. Like, each of these metrics that you can come up with can pretty naively be gamed um, or, or captured. Uh, and, and I call this game Captureopoly. It's, like, actually kind of fun. Like, sometimes you need to actually, like, do this and, like, walk this path yourself to see that it leads nowhere. Uh, and the point is we're missing basic primitives on blockchain, like identity. Right? We have no way to assert that the you know, particular token holder, particular account holder is like a human, not like a robot, and a unique human, right? And without these tools, I think we're really going to struggle to develop um, governance systems that are resistant to these sorts of things. Again, really complex and important topic, but there are no simple answers. So this is um, a framework that I've been developing um, and it's been emerging in blockchain recently. Uh, I call it Autonocrats and Anthropocrats. Uh, I'm going to attempt to introduce it to you guys. So apologies in advance, because this is all like super cutting edge stuff that like is being developed as we speak. Um, another thinker here, as I explain what this means, uh, in, in the Ethereum and blockchain world is a gentleman named Vlad Zamfir. Uh, he's been a core Ethereum researcher and contributor since the very beginning of the project. Um, and he posted an article in, I believe, January, introducing this concept of um, Zabo's Law. So, this is the core, most interesting kind of question or dilemma in blockchain governance right now. And let me try to explain. Um, there is a computer scientist named Nick Szabo. So this law that Vlad describes is uh, named in honor of Nick Szabo. Uh, it's not actually from Nick Szabo directly. And it says the following, right? It says that a blockchain fundamentally is a tool for um, what's called social scalability, okay? And so, so Nick Zabo created the concept of a smart contract back in the 90s. He was one of the original cypherpunks. He was working on uh, cryptocurrency before there was a Bitcoin. And this abstract concept of a smart contract is a really powerful idea. Right? Imagine that you have two people, Alice and Bob, who live in two different jurisdictions in the world. And they don't know each other's law and don't trust, they have no reason to trust each other's law. Maybe it's two countries or, or two continents or something, right? If those two parties, Alice and Bob, can agree it, it, the only requirement is they have to be able to like read code. They can read computer code, right? And if that's the case, then you can have this thing called a smart contract where you could come to an agreement and, and express it in 10 lines or 100 lines of code. And if you have a platform like Ethereum um, that's sort of a neutral platform, they can like transact in a trust-minimized fashion, okay? And the reason this is such a powerful idea is that it, it reduces the number of things, the number, which the last panel touched upon trust as well, right? It reduces the amount of things you need to trust in order to transact. So it reduces transaction costs and it reduces coordination costs massively. Um, you're not relying upon another law, you're not relying upon another culture, right? Uh, you're literally just relying upon things like the internet working, the Ethereum blockchain, continuing to create blocks, the ether, uh, the value of ether not going to zero, and code. And that's really it. So it, it allows entire classes of transactions that were not possible before. Um, this is sort of the platonic dream of a blockchain is for it to be this like neutral thing that has no social layer on top of it. It's just code. And so what Zablo's law said, says, what, what, what Vlad introduced here, is this idea that um, we only make changes to the blockchain protocol if they're required for like the technical function of the network. Right? So maybe we need to like increase throughput or, or increase security or something, but we don't want to ever introduce a social layer, like a port system or something, to a blockchain. And the reason for that is, the moment you do that, you begin, um, you begin sort of reducing the benefits of this sort of social scalability of the blockchain platform, right? So now you have Alice and Bob, and they no longer are just trusting Ethereum. They now have to trust that if they have a transaction, that there won't be some uh, social layer or social process that will come in and say, just kidding, you violated some social norm or law, we're gonna roll back your transaction, right? At that point, What's the difference? Just use a bank or use PayPal, right? Where you already have those those issues. So, um, so that's the argument for Zabo's law. So I call this camp the uh, autonocrats. Right? So autonocrats are people who put maximum maximal trust 
in autonomous systems. Blockchains are an example of that. But I think that as we move into a world in the future with things like AI, um, this question, this autonom autonomous versus, sorry, autonocrats versus anthropocrats uh, topic is going to become very large. Anthropocrats, as you can guess from the name, are people who don't really trust autonomous systems. They want like humans to be in charge and humans to have a, a layer of uh, uh, judgment here. Um, so the, the flip side here, right, the argument against something like Zabo's Law is the following, that um, without recognizing that blockchains are inherently social and sort of political things, and without engaging with real social systems in the real world, their appeal is going to be very limited. And so this is the type of work that Catherine and your team is doing, right, is figuring out how to take something like a blockchain, this like platonic concept, this technology, and like turning it into something that not only makes sense to business people and people around the world, but that in some way, shape, or form, like dovetails into existing legal and social systems. And so we have these two camps, right? You touched upon this at the end. It's very closely related to the question of like public versus private or permission blockchains as well. Because if you have Zombo's law, you can't have a permission blockchain. The idea is it's totally neutral. Um, and if, if blockchains are not able to engage with society and with the world and with existing legal systems, then they may just be ruled illegal in many jurisdictions. So core tension here, follow this space closely. I'll be like writing and speaking a lot more about this topic. Uh, so you kind of need that background to understand Ethereum's governance today. So let's dive in and talk a little bit about how Ethereum governance works. We have a group of people in Ethereum called core developers, okay? Core devs is not a super well-defined term. There's no strict criteria. This is some of those people. So, so this is actually three or four of the different uh, core teams at the most recent DevCon, the Ethereum Developer Conference um, in Prague in October, November of last year. And this is like the most ad hoc possible meeting, gathering, sitting on the floor, discussing you know, the future of the Ethereum network and how we should work together. And what I want to highlight by showing you this slide and these actual faces, right? I mean, uh, you know, that, that's Casey and that's Guillaume and that's Peter, right? These guys are, are ordinary human beings, um, is that the de facto situation in Ethereum today is we have this like technocratic council in the form of these core developers. So we have human beings that are sort of the root of legitimacy in the Ethereum network making decisions for the protocol. But the problem with, these, with the situation is that these folks um, are very technically minded, they're technically brilliant, they're kind of nerdy software developers. Trust me, no one will be offended if I say that. And, and the problem is that increasingly, the questions that we face in Ethereum are less technical and more and more social questions. So this problem how term may look familiar to some of you, it stands for programmatic proof of work. It's um, a proposal to change the proof of work algorithm in Ethereum to make it more ASIC resistant, and it promotes sort of decentralization of mining via GPUs. Um, it, there's arguments on either side here, but the point I want to highlight is that yes, while this is a technical question, it's a very social question as well, right? It, it, it touches upon philosophy and ethics and, and uh, social contract, and like, should we be favoring one group of stakeholders in Ethereum over another? And the core developers, these technical minds, are not prepared to answer these social questions today. Um, we do not have necessarily training in these fields, we don't have confidence that we can make the right decisions, and core developers are very worried about legal liability as well. If they step in and start making these decisions, people may come after them if they're unhappy. Uh, the, my sort of journey down this like governance rabbit hole started about a month ago, so this is a proposal, um, it's an EIP, which is an Ethereum Improvement Proposal, number 1890. It's an initiative that I'm helping spearhead to get um, more sustainable ecosystem funding in Ethereum by collecting some block rewards, which a number of blockchains do, but Ethereum does not today. Um, and you know, in trying to figure out how to make this work, we realized, again, this is 1% technical and 99% social. I wrote the code, it's five lines of code. Technologically, it's, uh, it's trivial. There's a very big, again, social question here, economics, philo philosophy, uh, even sort of um, political philosophy, right? questions about who's in charge and how the decisions get made. And we just don't have a mechanism to deal with this today in Ethereum. And then, again, we come back to this question of Zabo's law. If it's the case that blockchain can only ever be about technology and never touch upon social stuff, then like, I argue that we can't have nice, important things like sustainable funding for the public good. So this is going to be, I think, a big uh, open debate in the Ethereum community, and I think a lot of blockchains for quite some time. Uh, I had a tweet a few days ago um, on this where I kind of explored this a bit more, and I asserted that Ethereum governance has failed. It's a bit of a strong statement. Um, you know, you could rephrase this as risks failing or may fail or has become kind of stuck. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is a lot of these questions like ProgPow um, have really gummed up the system because we don't have these mechanisms in place to answer the social questions. Uh, and I go on in this thread to talk about um, some different uh, options on the table. 
And a lot of them are pretty unappealing right now, right? If we want to institute stronger governance, do we fall back on something like token voting? Um, that leads, that's plutocracy, right? And, and, and that's the way the real world works, but like, I am not excited about building plutocracy on the, on block, on the blockchain, right? I'm, I'm here to build like a better society, a better social system. Um, governance is really hard, it's like help us figure it out. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll, I'll close here with just some thoughts about, I think, uh, the direction we may want to go moving forward as a community and as a society. This was the best response I got to my tweet, and I really want to highlight this one. A gentleman named uh, Steve Randy Waldman. He said, effective systems mix and marble centralized and decentralized elements. The best economies are mixed economies. The decentralized elements check the centralized elements, make it difficult for them to act in arbitrary and harmful ways. The centralized elements first, and I'm sure he's first and foremost, uh, I believe what he says after this is um, sort of gather resources and, and exist to uh, foster the decentralized part of, of the ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, we have so many people who are extreme on one end or the other of the spectrum here saying, oh, we, everything must be decentralized, decentralize the world, decentralize all the things, everything should be public and open. And the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, people who want things to be highly centralized and say, oh, look at China, China's centralized and it's able to build amazing things, which is true, right? But like, as with most things, we have to kind of find like a, a happy medium here. And uh, the model that I'm sort of developing and, and trying to explore for projects like Ethereum is this like marble approach where we need a little bit of both. We need strong centralized leadership in some things like, like waving a flag and setting a vision and saying like this is what we stand for, this is what Ethereum is to us, um, gathering resources and then, and then allocating them in a more decentralized and fair fashion. A uh, few more thoughts. I think it's more, it's, it's important that at this moment in the development of blockchain that we just have this honest conversation about our failings, about what we've gotten right, what we've gotten wrong. And I think that's starting right now, which is really important, rather than being iron-fisted and saying, you know, no social anything. Um, I think we need to be very uh, clear with ourselves and with each other about things like our goals and our value and our vision for what blockchain can be, for what Ethereum can be. Um, and, and, and it's hard because we have a very diverse ecosystem and a very diverse set of interests. It's very difficult to arrive at sort of a single statement of shared values or goals, but that's okay. I think we can have multiple of them and they can overlap. Um, I, I talked about this already. We need sort of hybrid, centralized, decentralized systems of governance. This is a very active area of research. And you know, for, for those of you in, a, in an institution like Wharton and, and UPenn, um, this is, we could use your contributions. There's a lot of expertise in this room and in this, in this campus in, in, in sort of governance. Um, we need to keep on researching and work towards decentralization, right? That's clearly like a goal, is to build these fairer, more open, transparent, just systems that work for humans everywhere. Decentralization is a powerful tool, but like it's not necessarily an end state, it's more of a process. Uh, we need to just be honest with each other and realize that um, we can start small and do more experiments and fail fast, right? This is kind of lean startup methodology. I think that blockchain has been very bad about this. Ethereum has been terrible at this up to now because, again, we have this naive, idealistic view as engineers. If we build the perfect platform, like people will follow and, and everything will be amazing. Well, that's not actually how things get done in the real world. So this is another kind of like boulder that I'm sort of pushing on a bit in Ethereum. And, and people are uncomfortable, but like that's fine. Um, oh, all right. There's, an, there's another slide here, which I think this is not the latest version of this. Um, but the, the other slide here says, don't take ourselves too seriously. That's the, the, the thought I want to leave everybody on. Um, we should kind of enjoy this process and learn from each other. And like politics is beginning to kind of creep into these platforms. Um, and, and that's inescapable, like that's perfectly okay. But um, yeah, I think we need to kind of keep a level head and just recognize that there are um, powerful ideas here that unite everybody. Um, and just, you know, relax and have fun and enjoy building and exploring this topic together. Uh, cool, that's it, thank you so much. You can find me at Elredigon on Twitter.